And welcome to Tuesdays with the Pilgrim. We continue our journey with Christiana, Great Heart, Mercy, and the Boys with Chapter 29, Part 1, Lessons from the Dinner Table. Now the cook sent a message to them that dinner was almost ready. As they came into the room, someone had spread a tablecloth, and he was now setting the table, putting the cups, plates, and silverware, the salt and pepper, the bread and butter on the table. Then Matthew said, the sight of this tablecloth and these preparations for dinner makes my mouth water and gives me a greater appetite than I had before. And likewise, said Gaius, that all of the teachings that edify you in this life give birth to a greater desire within you to sit at the dinner of the great king in his kingdom. For all of the preaching, the books, and the commandments that are given here are like the mere laying out of the table service and the setting of the salt on the table when compared with the wondrous feast that our Lord will prepare for us when we arrive at his house. So it was time for dinner, and first the offered thigh and the wave breast were set on the table before them. This was to show them that they must begin their meal with prayer and praise to God. David had stood lifting his heart up to God with the offered thigh. He had used the wave breast offering where his heart lay to lean upon his harp as he played. These two dishes were very fresh and tasty, and they all ate heartily from them. Next they were brought a bottle of wine, as red as blood. Gaius said to them, Drink freely, for this is the juice of the true vine that gladdens the hearts of both God and man. So they gladly partook. Next a pitcher of milk was brought out, and Gaius said, Boys, you drink this pure milk that you may grow thereby. Following this, they brought out a dish of curds and honey. Eat freely of this, said Gaius, for it will both cheer you and strengthen you with wisdom and discernment. This was our Lord's food when he was a child. He will eat curds and honey when he grows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. After this, a very delicious bowl of apples was brought to them, and Matthew asked, since it was fruit that the serpent used to entice our first mother, why is it all right for us to eat it? Then Gaius responded, Fruit it was by which we were beguiled, yet sin not fruit has our souls defiled. Forbidden fruit eaten corrupts the blood, to partake when commanded does us good. Drink from his vessels, O church, his dove, and eat the fruit of him whom you love. Then Matthew said, I made an issue of this because I will never forget how sick I got from eating fruit. Forbidden fruit will make you sick, replied Gaius, but you need not fear that which our Lord has permitted. While they were still talking, they were presented with yet another dish, a bowl of nuts. Someone at the table said, Nuts can ruin tender teeth, especially the teeth of children. When Gaius heard this, he replied, Hard texts are nuts, I won't call them cheaters whose shells kept their kernels from the eaters. So open the shells, and you'll find the meat. They're brought here for you to crack and then eat. Chapter 29, Part 2 Relaxing with some riddles After this they were all very happy, and they sat at the table for a long time, talking about many things. Then the old gentleman said, My good landlord, while we are cracking these nuts, if you will, I would like you to solve this riddle. There was a man, though some counted him mad, the more he cast away, the more he had. Everyone looked at Gaius, wondering what he might say. He sat still for a while, then then replied, He that bestows his goods upon the poor shall have as much again and ten times more. Then Joseph said, Really, sir, I didn't think you would be able to solve it. Oh, replied Gaius, I have been trained up in this way for a great while. Nothing can teach better than experience. I have learned from my lord to be kind, 
and have found out by experience that I have gained by doing so. One man gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes up to poverty. There is one who makes himself rich, yet has nothing, and one who makes himself poor, yet has great riches. Then Samuel whispered to Christiana, Mother, this is the house of a very good man. Let us stay here for a long time, and let Matthew marry Mercy before we leave here. Gaius, overhearing this, said, I am certainly willing, young man. So they stayed there for quite some time, and Mercy was given to Matthew to be his wife. While they were staying there, Mercy, as she had always done, continued making coats and other garments for the poor. Because of this, she gained a good reputation amongst the pilgrims. But to return to our story, after dinner the younger boys wanted to go to bed, since they were tired from traveling. So Gaius called for someone to show them to their rooms, but Mercy offered to take them instead. They slept very well, but the rest of them stayed up all night. Gaius was such good company they didn't want to part. After much talk about their lord, about themselves, and about their journey, old Mr. Honest began to nod off. "'What, sir? Are you beginning to get drowsy?' asked Greatheart. "'Come, perk up. I have a riddle for you.' "'Let's hear it,' said Mr. Honest. So Greatheart said, "'He that will kill must first be overcome, and he who would live abroad must first die at home.' Ha! Huh, said Mr. Onus, that is a hard one. Hard to explain and harder to live. But come, landlord, if you will, I will leave my part to you. Please explain it, and I will listen to what you say. No, said Gaius, the riddle was put to you, and it's only right that you should try to answer it. So the old gentleman replied, He first by grace must conquered be, for his sins to be mortified. And who that lives would convince me, unto himself must I. That is right, replied Gaius. Good doctrine and experience both teach us this. For first, before grace discloses itself and overwhelms one soul with its glory, that soul is altogether unable to oppose sin. If sin is Satan's cord that binds a person's soul, how can he resist strongly enough to break free from the bondage? And secondly, no one who acknowledges reason or grace believes that such a person can be a living testimony of grace while he is still a slave to his own sin. Chapter 29, Part 3 Old Men versus Young Men That brings to my remembrance a story worth listening to. There were two men who left on a pilgrimage. The one began when he was young, the other when he was old. The young man wrestled with powerful struggles with sin, while the old man's inclinations to sin had subsided because of the declining vitality that the course of nature brings. Yet the young man walked his steps as evenly and as easily as the old one did. Which one of them would you say walked more clearly in the power of God's grace, since both seemed to be alike? Doubtless the young one, replied Mr. Honest, for the one who goes against the greatest opposition demonstrates that he is the stronger one, especially when he is able to keep pace with the one who does not meet with half as much opposition. And the older one certainly does not. Besides, I have observed that old men often pride themselves mistakenly, in that they tend to view their weakening inclinations to sin as some victorious conquest over sin in their lives. In this they deceive themselves. Indeed, old men who are full of grace are best able to give advice to those who are young because they have experienced firsthand the emptiness of most things. But yet for an old man and a young man to set out together, the young one is the most likely to have the advantage of discovering a wonderful work of grace in his life because the old man's fleshly desires are naturally weaker. So they went on talking like this until dawn. Chapter 29, Part 4, Responses to Christ When everyone was up, Christiana asked her son James to read a chapter out loud to all of them. So he read Isaiah 53. When he had finished, Mr. Honest asked why it said that the Savior would come, quote, out of dry ground, unquote, 
and why, quote, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, unquote. Greatheart responded, In answer to the first question, I believe it's because the church of the Jews from which Christ came had lost nearly all of the substance and spirit of its religion. To the second question, my answer is that the words are descriptive of how Christ looks through the eyes of unbelievers, because they lack the vision to see into our prince's heart. They tend to judge him solely on his outward appearance, which lacked any distinctive qualities. They are just like those who, being ignorant of the facts that precious gemstones are covered with a crust that looks quite common, will toss a precious gem away because they don't realize the worth of what they are looking at. They treat it just as they would an ordinary stone. And we'll stop there for today, and next week we'll pick up with Chapter 29, Part 5, Hunting Down and Destroying Giant Slaygood. Until then, take care, stay safe, and God bless. Thank mm-hmm. you.